we'll get started. I'll call to order the Green Mountain Care Board's hearing of January 31st, uh, 2024. Um, we're down uh, a couple personnel today. Um, Dr. Merman will not be here today, so there'll be four board members. And then um, our executive director, Susan Barrett, is, is out today as well. So we'll skip the executive director's report and the two agenda items, the standard qualified health plan design proposal um, by the Department of Vermont Health Access, and then the health resource allocation plan update um, by GMCB. We have a hard 345 stop today, which I don't think will be a problem, and we will um, hold public comment to the very end. Uh, first, I'll bring up the meeting minutes from January 17th, 2023. Is there a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 I. Uh, Member Walsh, I didn't hear you, so I'm not sure. Tom, did you vote? Not sure if you can hear me. Hey, Tom, shake your hand if you can see me or hear me. All right, well, we have three votes, so the minutes are approved, and I'll check in with Member Walsh to make sure he can hear everything. Um, we'll turn to our first presentation, which is a standard qualified health plan design proposal, and uh, I'll turn to um, uh, the Vermont Department of Health Access. Yes, hi, this is Dana Houlihan, uh, Plan Management Director for uh, Indiva. I will just start us off. Um, I'm joined by Addie Stremelo, who will provide some um, introductory comments at the very beginning. Then um, we're also joined by Darren Johnson and Julie Pepper of Wakely Consulting, um, who will guide us through the presentation after some introductory um, slides that I will cover. So, um, Addie, I'll hand it to you first. If, if uh, thank you. Thanks, Dana. Um, hello, board members. Thank you for having us today. Uh, my name is Addie Stremelo. I am currently the acting commissioner of the Department of Vermont Health Access. Um, my usual job is deputy commissioner of DIVA, uh, where I oversee eligibility and enrollment, including the um, health insurance marketplace. Um, and I just wanted to be here briefly to recognize what an important milestone this is and the kind of annual dialogue around qualified health plans. Um, the work uh, around the 2025 design has been going on now for a few months, but this is kind of the first you know, public discussion um, of that topic and an important part of our regulatory partnership. Um, so thank you again for having us. Um, I wanted to mention that in the eligibility and enrollment space at DIVA, we have been very focused over the last year on Medicaid uh, and Medicaid renewals in particular coming out of the public health emergency. Um, the restart of that process, which happened last April, has resulted in coverage loss and coverage transitions um, as expected um, as people come off of Medicaid and um, look for other options. Uh, what that has uh, a result of that has been a significant increase in our qualified health plan enrollment, um, which you'll see in our enrollment data. Um, we are uh, about halfway through, a little over halfway through now, this, this big renewal restart, um, and our overall renewal rate is 60%. But among those who are no longer eligible for Medicaid, we're seeing about a 20 to 30% what we call conversion rate over to qualified health plan coverage um, on a monthly basis, which is pretty high, at least in the national conversation. Um, and, and that does mean that our overall enrollment is higher than it's been in some time. Um, you'll see, I think it's about a 16% increase year over year. There's been a lot of national news around qualified health plan enrollment. Um, I think the signups exceeded 21 million. Um, for this year's open enrollment period, and uh, 5 million of those um, are from state-based exchanges like Vermont's. Here in Vermont, we had over 30,000 plan selections for 2024, which is 
the highest we've seen since uh, switching to allowing for direct enrollment back in, I think it was 2016. So hopefully the enroll enrollment information and kind of landscape um, distribution of plan selection is informative as you all review the proposed plan designs for 2025. Um, and with that, I will turn it back to Dana to start that discussion. Thanks, Addy. So let me attempt to share my screen. Can everyone see that? Yes. Okay, thank you. So just basically our um, agenda for the day is to, I will begin by providing fairly high level overview of our um, stakeholder process and uh, what goes into building the proposal that we have for you today. Uh, we'll go through that proposal with our partners from Wakely Consulting who provide actuarial services for us. And then as usual, um, we will you know, be available for comments, questions, discussion at the end of today's meeting and planning to return next week for follow-up questions, comments, etc. And if prepared for the board's vote. Again, just for review, we are here today to talk about the standard uh, qualified health plans, which will be seven plans from each issuer. That's one platinum, one gold, two silver, one of which is a deductible plan and one is a high deductible health plan um, in that structure. And then there are three bronze plans, two are deductible plans and one is a high deductible health plan. I provided a separate one page handout for your reference. It shows what is available on the exchange in 2024. Um, you know, currently, so um, that's just for your reference and, and uh, we expect 2025 to be very similar. So again, a word about our stakeholder group conversation. I lead this group and we begin to meet in late, this, late November, early December. Uh, our membership includes myself from DIVA, uh, representatives from each issuer, representatives from the Healthcare Advocates Office, and then staff from both the uh, Department of Financial Regulation and Green Mountain Care Board. So we have very robust discussion and what, what we do is take, we start by reviewing federal guidance changes as much as you know, we have at the beginning of our process and throughout. Um, we take one metal level at a time and uh, discuss in good detail to come up with our proposed changes. And then moving on, again, I won't read these, but value, affordability, stability, attractiveness, and usefulness are very much on our minds as we uh, go through the um, each metal level, um, comparing it to, you know, what changes may be required plan by plan um, and how to um, make decisions about cost share benefit changes that will be compliant with the guidance and also um, attractive in our marketplace for our membership. skip this one. So a little bit more on affordability. Um, again, as, as most of you have seen from previous years, we, the general idea is that the higher the actuarial value, generally the higher the premium will be. Uh, that's certainly through metal level by metal level. Um, so at each plan level, we're very mindful of a change that will affect AV thinking about a possible, you know, the likely impact on premium. Um, at the silver level, this has the added impact of um, the higher the benchmark plan, which is the second lowest cost silver plan, the higher the premium for that plan, whichever one it ends up being, whichever silver plan, that leads to an increase in 
the um, APTC calculation for that year. So, so that's important. We're very mindful of that as we make any changes in the silver plans. Um, the state supports what we you know what can be done to um, maximize AV in the silver plans to increase that subsidy availability. Understanding that um, not all silver plan enrollees are enrolled through the exchange and APTC eligible, but that's very much on our minds as we make our decisions. Uh, the a, the compliant AV de minimis ranges, meaning the acceptable uh, AV range for silver plans is compressed to facilitate the principle of going towards the higher end of AV to maximize um, APTC. For example, um, some plans may have that, like the goal, the goal plan could be um, minus two and plus two of the 80% average for a gold plan, but a silver plan is only allows the um, AV range to be 70 plus. And then just a note that the that silver loading will continue in 2025 with the, you know, functioning the same as it has in previous years. So our approach as we look at each um, each uh, metal level is to do strategic minimal increases. That's to avoid large swings in uh, of an impact from if we do nothing in one year, thinking ahead to the next two or three years where large increases or changes may be required, which could be disruptive to the market. We think about the overall cost, which is not only premium, but um, the cost share decisions that we make, which impact the out of pocket for uh, for our enrollees. And then we're very mindful not to create any kind of a um, plan design or make a decision that could be difficult for consumers to understand. We want their plan information to be you know, as, as friendly as possible. So then just a quick look, a review of our uh, certification timeline each year. So we are in the, the uh, process of the first bullet here, going through the uh, presentation of standard plan designs completed in by February. And then in March, the issuers will submit their forms, which is summaries of benefits and benefit um, uh, and cost shares and their certificates to DFR with approval anticipated in June. The uh, final notice of um, benefit and payment parameters is due in the spring each year. Um, that may or may not impact some of the information that we have um, gone forward with in today's presentation, and Darren will highlight some of those things. Um, rate proposals are submitted in May with all of the process that you're well aware of and final decisions in early August. Then plan certification follows that at the very end of August. That's the step of formal approval and selection for the plans that will be offered on the exchange in the coming year and then as you know open enrollment begins november 1st of this year through january 15th of 2025 so that's our cycle so any questions on our stakeholder process the, um, guiding principles and those kinds of things okay hearing none i will turn it to darren Anybody able to see a PowerPoint and hear me talking? Perfect. 
Okay, so outline of what we're going to go over today. This is very similar to previous years um, for all of you who have been around. Uh, we'll start off, as Dana mentioned, with the propo proposed regulation changes, um, especially focused on the out of pocket max changes. And then we'll discuss some pretty major differences in the federal AV calculator this year that had large impacts on plan designs. Um, and then go through by plan what our recommended plan design changes um, are by metal level. So first off, what are the key regulatory changes this year when we're looking at 2025 related to 2024? Um, so the big big headliner off the top is that the annual limitation on cost sharing um, was released. That's a separate letter from the NBPP. It is finalized. It will be $9,200 for 2025, which is a decrease um, from the 9450 in 2024. So this is the first time that has decreased. Um, so that'll have some impacts down the line on how we did some of our modeling. Um, but that's a keynote up front that 9,200 is the highest we can set the individual out of pocket maximum at. Um, and then we mentioned kind of those federal HDHP minimum deductible and out of pocket maximum limits. Um, so what's the, the smallest deductible we can have and still have a plan qualify as an HDHP? Um, in 2024, these were 1,600 and 8,050 respectively. Um, we usually expect that to increase 50 bucks every two or three years. It's been increasing more recently due to inflation. Our best guess right now is that'll go up to 1650 and we'll have to tweak plan designs a little bit. Um, and I'll point those out when we get there. Um, but we'll kind of see once we once we get that estimate. Um, that out of pocket max limit increased by 550 last year. That doesn't have as large of an impact on plan designs. Um, typically it's more the deductible one we have to worry about. Um, and we'll kind of see see where that goes this year, especially with the decrease to the, the individual limit. Um, for now, our proposed plan designs are just assuming that that deductible limit will remain at 1600. Um, assuming it does change, we'll have to adjust some plan designs, but typically those are, are fairly minor, minor adjustments. Um, there were other changes in the 2025 notice of benefit and payment parameters. Um, there was nothing nothing major, nothing that really impacted plan designs directly. Um, if anything changes in the final one, um, obviously we'll address that at that time. So the, the draft actuarial value calculator, so this slide just kind of describes how the actuarial value calculator works. This is a model released by CMS that determines an actuarial value, what percentage of total you know, health costs are paid by the plan um, for the purposes of determining compliance with metal level requirements. Um, notably, this is not a pricing AV. It's based on summarized national data. It's not based on Vermont specific experience. Um, it uses kind of national level trend factors. Um, each carrier will have their own model and the methodology may differ. Um, and not all service categories are represented in the ABC. So no, notably, they don't have an input for like urgent care. Um, so if you have a different copay for urgent care, that's not something they really capture. Um, so what changed this year? So first off, reminder that this it's currently in draft format. Um, typically, we don't see changes between draft and final, um, but it is always possible that they could change something between draft and final, and we'd have to go back and remodel and make sure that that everything was still in compliance. Um, so the big change this year was they updated the data underlying the model. So for a number of years, they've been using a, a data set of 2018, primarily large group data, um, but group data. Um, they updated the data set to 2021 edge data, which is a name for where they collect ACA data to run like risk adjustment and high cost risk pooling calculations. Um, so it's 2021 ACA data, both individual and small group. Um, they trend it from 21 to 25. The most recent year of trend was a little higher than usual, again, kind of due to the general you know, inflationary environment. Um, and then they lowered the, the ceiling at which they threw out members for outliers. Um, and the, all of these together meant that silver and bronze allowed cost actually decreased by a decent amount, almost 4% compared to 2024, even with an additional year of trend. And the impact of that is that the lower a population's PMPM, the lower the AV will be on a given plan design. If you have a $2,000 deductible and your population accrues $10,000 of costs a year, that deductible is a lot more valuable than if your population accrues $4,000 of costs a year. So any decrease in allowed cost decreases AV. The impact of this is it actually reduces the magnitude of changes required. Um, in normal years, most plans are near the top of the, the AV de minimis range. 
the AV update updates, they kick out above the top. We have to lower benefits to get them back within those those required ranges. Um, this year, that is still the case somewhat for, for some plan designs, but especially silver and bronze, it's generally the other direction where AV is actually decreased year over year. Um, there were some other changes about how costs shifted between categories. Um, I highlighted PCB versus specialists actually on the drug side, I think was where we felt the impact a little more with a lot more drug shifting to specialist and non-preferred brand. Um, but overall kind of this, this change in allowed cost was probably the biggest, biggest headline. As we go into the plan design slides, um, after this, we're gonna be talking about estimated premium impact we're gonna be showing on slides. Um, in the past, we've just had this as kind of a percentage based on a pricing AV change in our own internal weekly plan valuation model based on the Vermont specific plan designs. Um, we've added a dollar amount estimate, um, and this was just, you know, for the silver deductible plan, we took the average of the silver deductible standard silver deductible plan premiums in the 2024 market, um, just 50 50 between the two carriers. We did not adjust for trend. Um, we did not adjust for, you know, contracting or any of the other, you know, hard things that go into pricing. Just what's the premium last year? If we think the pricing AV will increase 2%, we increase the premium 2% and then show that as a dollar value just to make it a little easier to kind of understand the changes that are occurring. Um, and all of those are going to be the, the dollar value for an individual contract, um, not for a family contract or um, spouse contract or anything. So let me pause there quick. Were there any questions on all my information dense slides on kind of regulatory changes? Uh, I don't Perfect. think so. Perfect. Um, so overall, what is the the impact of all this? So changes are required to a number of uh, plans due to the federal out-of-pocket max decrease. Um, we had three plans that had out-of-pocket maxes higher than that 9,200, so we have to bring it down to the 9,200 um, just to comply with that. Um, even if changes are not required, we still had some changes that we thought would be a good idea to avoid um, either AV increases being passed on as premium increases um, or just stabilizing changes for further years. Um, and we had to make some changes to the silver CSR plan designs. Um, those have a much narrower de minimis range, so it's a lot easier to fall in or out of that. Um, we do not go through those in this call, but those are included in the appendix if you wanted to review them. Um, and then we'll show the target range we're shooting for in each plan when we get to those slides. Um, but we do have a number of differences between the Vermont um, kind of standard plan ranges and the, the strict federal ranges, um, where because the deductible is, is waived for preventive prescription drugs, we add a 0.5% cushion on the high end to high deductible health plans. Um, for the, the provision around limiting out-of-pocket expenses for insulin, we add a 0.1% cushion on the high end for bronze plans. And then since the AVC does not allow you to model um, free mental health and substance abuse visits, um, we add a small multiplicative factor um, on silver deductible and bronze deductible without pharmacy limit plans to capture those, those three visits um, and model that since the AVC does not. So at a high level, what are we looking like? So in this table, I've got the final 2024 federal AVC for the standard plans. And then when we take the exact exact plan from 2024 and run it on 2025, um, how did things change? So noticeably for the four of them that actually have a value, they're actually all platinum went up a tiny bit and the other three all decreased um, between a little bit on gold to half a percent on silver and almost 1% on bronze. Um, so pretty noticeable decreases there. And then we had three that we could no longer run because their MOOP was greater than the 9,200 and thus it wouldn't run without adjustment. I believe if the only change we made was just to reset the MOOP to 9,200, these all were still within the ranges. I think the silver was very close to dropping out of the bottom end of the range. And then this is where those features I just mentioned, those plan design features. So on silver, we have a 0.5% cushion on the high end for the HDHP. On the bronze, we have both the 0.5% and a 0.1% on the HDHP. The non-HDHP bronzes have a 0.1%. And then all of these are reflecting, not all of these, sorry, um, the silver and bronze plans are reflecting that 1.001 factor. 
So we'll show a number of changes here. The ones that actually require formal approval are as follows, um, copay, co-insurance, deductible increases, and then the big one this year is that out-of-pocket max increase. Um, in typical years, this has been if we increase the out-of-pocket max by more than the federal increase, it requires approval. In this case, since the federal increase was a decrease, even if we leave the out-of-pocket max the same compared to last year, it technically will require formal approval um, because the change is less than the decrease was. Um, so we'll try to show this formatting. Anything we change from prior plan designs will be shaded orange. Any changes that require this formal approval will be shaded green. Um, and then if it didn't actually change but requires formal approval, it'll be green and not bold. Um, and I'll I'll point that out as we as we get to those. So the high level, this is this is the summary of what has changed. Um, so the only notes that require formal approval are going to be those those green boxes where the out of pocket maxes um, were changed, and then we have a couple spots where we've actually been able to decrease benefits or. We've decreased copays, which increases benefits, um, which we'll highlight as we get there in coinsurance as well, um, which really was driven by the ABC changes, giving us a lot more room to maneuver than we've had in the past. Um, but we'll we'll get into the specific plan designs, go through all of these, and then we'll see this slide again at the end. So we'll start off with platinum. So first off, I have kind of a history slide, what's changed in this plan over the years. Um, for the most, most part, it's just been small deductible or MOOP changes every year a little bit of a gap you know every year again and then a switch to having three free visits um, back in 2023. So for this plan design we have kind of a preferred and a backup option we're showing so the preferred option is just small increases to the out-of-pocket max on the medical and pharmacy side um, just to bring it up to that $1,600 limit from last year kind of true that up between plans a little more um, and that would have a premium impact of about 0.2%. So this is, you know, kind of the first time we're seeing these new premium impact slides. So that translates into roughly two dollars and fifty cents per member per month, thirty dollars per member per year. Um, and then our backup option was just leave everything the same. Um, that roughly doubles the premium impact. Um, so you see about four dollars and seventy cents per member per month. Um, again, just from impacts to plan design, not from any other um, pricing impacts, but. Those were kind of our, our thoughts on the platinum plan. And then, yeah, we're keeping the deductible consistent. That's changed a lot in recent years. Like to just leave it flat um, and then increase the pharmacy out of pocket max to be consistent with kind of the HTHP levels, bring medical to the same level. On the gold deductible plan, um, this is one that typically we hit the far end of the range and have to cut benefits a decent amount to bring it back in. Um, we can see in 2023, we had a $200 increase to deductible and MOOP. Um, in 2024, we decided to give consumers a break on that side and just increase co-pays instead. Um, and then this year, we have, again, kind of two options. So the preferred option for this one is actually leave everything the same, except for taking the pharmacy out-of-pocket max up to $1,600. Again, the, the HGHP limit I've, I've talked about. Um, so this is... Again, this technically requires formal approval because we're not dropping the MOOP 250, but we'd be leaving the MOOP the same. Um, that is a higher premium impact than the Platinum plan does. Um, we'd be looking at about a, a $10 PMPM premium increase from leaving benefits the same while costs are, are presumed increasing. Um, so these benefits would be worth more this year at predicted cost levels than they would have been last year, um, just due to due to trend and benefit leveraging. Um, so we did include a backup option as well, which would be just a small increase to the, the medical out-of-pocket max, just to take a little bit out of that, that premium increase. But the, the preferred option was leave the, the, the medical out-of-pocket max the same and just increase the pharmacy one a little bit. Um, so again, give consumers a break on the, the large deductible and MOOP increases, not touch copays, and then increase that pharmacy out-of-pocket max to be consistent. Silver deductible plan. So this is another one that traditionally has needed large increases year over year to stay within the de minimis range. Um, the silver range is only 70 to 72 percent, so fairly narrow compared to you know gold, platinum, and bronze, which all have much much wider ranges. 
Um, so you can see 2023, $600 deductible increase, you know, $550 maximum out of pocket increase. 2024, we got a bit of a break. Um, last year, they had some methodology methodology changes in the draft AV calculator um, that made copay plans look less rich in terms of what the calculator was calculating, which helped out a little bit. So last year, we only had to increase the MOOP a little bit. We didn't have to touch the deductible. Um, we didn't have to touch copays. Um, so certainly an improvement compared to 2023 in terms of changes needed. Um, so this year, um, this is a plan that after the changes, as I mentioned, was on the very low end of the de minimis. Um, and generally, as Dana was talking about, the silver plans, we try to aim to have a little higher on the AV range um, to maximize the second lowest cost silver plan, maximize your APTCs for all consumers. Obviously, we only control the standardized silvers, um, but you know, generally, if these are moving up, presumably other ones in the market might move up as well. So the second lowest cost silver plan um, should you know, move similarly to these. Um, the dynamics should be the same around silvers. So the preferred option here is actually a lot of benefit increases um, for the first time ever. So the medical deductible cut by $500 to $3,500. The MOOP we bring down to that federal limit. So again, this requires approval, even though it's a MOOP decrease because it's not cut by $250. We would increase the pharmacy MOOP still to that $1,600 threshold and then give back an ER copay increase from a few years ago. I think that was 2023 as well. And then take a cut the generic uh, drug copay also back to that pre-2023 level um, was the thought. So the trade-off here for all these increases, we end up kind of smack dab in the middle of the AV range. So this one target in the top can go 70 to 72%. We're at a 71% right in the middle. And there's a, there is a pretty you know, substantive premium increase associated with all of those. We project you know, roughly 2.2%, $250 per year for an individual contract, $20 a month for an individual contract. Um, you know, the hope is that you know, for subsidized members, most of that you know, flows through into subsidies and is not realized, but obviously for, you know, unsubsidized members, there's a trade-off there with these benefit increases. Um, so we did include a backup option that cuts that at least a little bit. Um, so this one is the same, except the deductible decreases by 250 instead of 500. Um, a key thing to note for this plan too is I, you know, kind of skip over these rows a decent amount of the time, but they're very important for understanding the dynamics of how responsive a plan is to what the deductible changes are. So for this plan, the deductible is waived for lots of things, all preventive services, all office visits, urgent care, ambulance, and then all generic drugs. Um, so changing the deductible does not have as much impact as the overall AV as it would in some other plans where the deductible applies to more things. And I'll highlight those when we get to that. Um, so that's why this $250 deductible increase, which I think sounds pretty large, only really knocks premiums down about a dollar per member per month. But that's what we're looking for on the silver deductible side. Um, and I've, I've talked to most of these, but we have it in the slide as well. Um, just try to trying to use the space we've been given to kind of undo some some large increases in recent years. You know, hopefully encourage medication adherence by cutting the generic drug copay a little bit. Um, you know, we could slash that ER copay in, in half without a whole lot of added cost sharing burden, added premium burden, and then you know lower cost sharing burden when emergency care is truly needed. Um, and then, as discussed, you know, theoretically, we could take this up to 72%, um, but, you know, that would result in a much higher, much higher premium for non-subsidized members. And then, you know, next year, presumably, we're going to end our train of luck of methodology changes and data changes um, being the, the large changes in the ABC versus just trend and get back to a spot where, you know, silver ABs increase one to one and a half or even higher percent year over year. And if we're at the very top of the limit, then next year we're just going to have to yo-yo back on these benefits. Um, whereas this way, you know, hopefully there's a chance where this plan can stay mostly the same next year and still be compliant with, with the federal limits. Next up is the silver HDHP. Um, so this slide's a little messier with all the changes to the embedded MOOP having to be highlighted, but um, last year, we decided to increase coinsurances instead of touching the deductible, just to give a break from kind of the the big deductible increase in 2023 and deductible increases for several years before that. Um, so that was the the major change last year was on the coinsurance side. Um, so this plan is is going to be pretty similar to the 
the silver deductible um, in terms of where we ended on the AV range and right around a 71%. Um, our preferred option is basically leave the deductible and MOOP the same. The embedded deductible decreases with the federal decrease and then give a little bit back of coinsurance on the, the PCP and mental health and substance abuse office visit side, hopefully encourage more of those. Um, those types of types of visits um, and this plan may have to change a little bit should the HDHP minimum deductible shift that would be this pharmacy out of pocket max here would potentially have to go up to 1650. Um, we wouldn't have to change anything else about the plan if that would happen it would still definitely fall within the, the de minimis ranges um, as a reminder this plan the ceiling of the range is 71.5% not 72% due to being an HDHP. Um, and the Vermont specific provisions for HDHPs um, around preventive drugs. Um, so we're closer to the top of the range than we were on the silver deductible. And the estimated premium impact of all of this is about 1.4%, $13 per member per month, 160 per year. Um, backup option is just leave the coinsurance the same, um, cut that premium impact just a little bit, you know, about 50 cents per member per month. Um, so the preferred was to was to give that coinsurance back, but did include the backup option as well. Um, and again, talked about all these. The the coinsurance doesn't have a huge impact on on premium, but you know, hopefully encourages some more preventive and appropriate use of services for members who are impacted. Um, and again, similar to the previous one, we're not maximizing the AV, um, just to kind of at least cut that premium increase a little bit for non-subsidized members and give us some breathing room going into next year. Next up onto the bronze plan. So this is the bronze deductible plan with the pharmacy limit. Um, this one has not had as many changes in general year over year. The bronze plans have a much wider de minimis range. So unlike silver and gold, we're not always you know, at the top of the range and having to make big changes just to be compliant. Um, so 2023, while well, everything else was getting huge benefit slashes, this one had a you know, out of pocket increase, you know, somewhat substantive, but not as, changes across the board. Um, last year, again, we brought the out-of-pocket max up to the, the federal level um, and then had an increase on the generic drug copay. Um, so changes for this year. So the preferred option is we bring the out-of-pocket max back to the federal maximum level, which would be a decrease in that, and then take the pharmacy out-of-pocket max up to that HDHP limit um, to align with the other bronze plan and then give that copay increase back that we had just last year. Um, go back to the $15. Um, and that has a, a decent premium impact, you know, 2.5%, um, $215 a year, you know, $18 a month. You know, bronze members are often going to be more premium sensitive. So that's definitely something we, we discussed was having that level of premium impact. Um, again, hopefully a lot of these members will be subsidized. Um, and if silver plans are increasing a similar amount, hopefully APTC subsidies are increasing um, to help help deal with that premium impact, but did want to note that. Um, and then the backup option would just be leave the generic copay the same, um, and it, it tweaks premium impact a little bit. Um, and then to highlight the, the ABC range there for bronze plans, for this plan it's 58 to 64.9%. So we have a very wide range. We're kind of in the, the middle upper end of that range. So it's it's rare that we would get over that 64.9%. And again, reduce the generic drug copay, encourage medication adherence, hopefully. And then as discussed, we're trying to balance stabilizing the cost share increases um, or even giving back a little bit, cost share decreasing, and then anticipated premium impact for these members who are likely more price sensitive. On the bronze deductible side, so this one does not have that pharmacy limit. Um, and this plan is very simple. Um, the deductible is only waived for preventive and office visits and then generic drugs. Um, and then the plan basically just increases to match the federal deductible and MOOP or be very close to it year over year. Um, so this one, the primary option is, is pretty simple, just cut deductible and MOOP back down to the new federal limits and then give a little bit of copay back on the, the generic side. Um, the backup option is cut things down a little bit more um, and have the same copay reduction. Um, so preferred option, $200 per member per year premium increase. The backup option is a little more expensive on the premium impact side, um, but not, not too much higher. 
And then, yeah, again, similar to the other ones, you know, reduce the generic drug copay, encourage adherence, bring the out-of-pocket max and deductible down to the new federal level. And again, we're balance, balancing these priorities on the, the bronze plans. Then lastly, we have our bronze HGHP. Um, so this one has been, you know, fairly, you know, small deductible changes year over year. Um, some updates to the, to the MOOP to match to those federal limits as those have changed. Um, and then this is just uh, the deductible is waived for basically nothing. Um, so this is a big contrast to that silver plan we were looking at earlier. For this plan, the deductible applies to everything other than preventive categories and preventive medical categories and preventive scripts. Everything else has the deductible apply. So for this one, the preferred option is um, cut the, the medical out of pocket a little bit, bring that down to 7,100, um, and then just the embedded MOOP resets to the federal limit. That's about a 1.7% premium impact, about $150, so not as high as some of the other bronze plans, assuming that this is probably the most price sensitive members looking at this you know, HDHP bronze plan. Um, and then the backup option would be, let's cut that premium impact even more. Um, we'll increase the deductible a little bit. Um, we'll take that premium impact down to about $135 a year um, just from these these changes to the to the plan design. And again, this is the other HDHP, so if this the minimum deductible changes, we might have to increase the, the pharmacy pharmacy deductible and out-of-pocket max a little bit um, to align with that so that it is still uh, an HSA qualified plan. And yeah, small reduction, cut member cost sharing a little bit. Um, and again, with the bronze plan, it's just balancing those priorities. So now back to the the summary of everything. So I apologize for that. I went through went through everything quickly. Um, were there any any questions or specific plan designs you wanted to go back to and kind of look at in more detail? Um, or anything I've discussed that would be helpful to cover again. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, very quickly, could you go back to the slides um, that show the premiums? I'm sorry, not the premiums, but each of the plans. Um, there's a lot of information on there, mm -hmm. and I was just getting oriented to what is where. So um, this one, or uh, let's could you bring up 18? 18. Nope. 19. This one, um, but for each of the plans, OK? I'm just looking at the increase, the estimated premium impact per year and per month. Mm -hmm. And I didn't see that at first because I was looking at the green and the pink. Um, yes. So could you just show that for gold, silver, and bronze also, please? Yep. Yeah, so for platinum, okay. I'll just quote the yearly numbers, basically 30 and 60 for preferred and backup. And I apologize mm -hmm. for not bringing more attention to that the first time. Um, for gold, much higher, about 110 for our preferred and then 95 on the backup. Um, silver deductible, this is I think the most impacted one we have, 250 for the preferred, 230 on the backup. Mm -hmm. Silver HDHP, 160 on the preferred, 155 on the backup. Okay. Bronze deductible, Thank 215. You got the other bronzes. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, and it, and again, stressing one more time, this is just due to plan design changes and the impact of trend on benefit leveraging. We're not accounting for the impact of trend on medical costs or any other considerations for premium impacts. Or said another way, it's important that we not try to draw a straight line from the figures that we're presenting here based on the benefit calculator and our plan design decisions on compared to what will come from the issuers in their pricing model and plan by plan premium increases. So this is just a directional comparison year over year, trying to assign some dollar value to it, but it's not it's not fair to say that that will be the premium increase for any one of these plans. I know that's hard. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying. Um, and um, Darren, just a moment ago, you said th something about um, used medical trend twice, and I, I had as a question to ask later, um, what is 
in your analysis, what's the largest driver of these increases year over year? Yeah, so medical trend, that's a, a good call out. There's the impact on just medical costs. So if costs are $800, there's 5% medical trend. Now they're $840, there's an additional $40 of cost. That's one, we don't touch that. What we do touch though is the impact of trend on benefit leveraging. So when I go and model these, these plans to get these premium impacts, the 2024 plan I model at a 2024 PMPM level um, based on assumptions we've we've worked through with this the state. And then the 2025 plans I model at a trended amount. So we assume a level of trend and model at that higher PMPM. So because of that, the same deductible in 24 and 25 are worth different amounts. The 25 one is worth more because we assume higher costs, more members hit their deductible, more members go over their out-of-pocket max, that same benefit is worth more. So this year, the majority, I don't know, let me, it depends on the plan design, because some of them we made pretty pretty substantive benefit decreases on, so like the silver, you know, the silver deductible, we, we had a lot of benefit increases. So a, a decent chunk of that is going to be just the, the benefit increases. But I think even on this plan, the majority of it is that benefit leveraging. Um, if we are modeling claims uh, increasing, you know, 7% a year, 6, 7% a year, um, these plans are impacted more. On the platinum side, where we had that much smaller premium impact, the allowed claims level for platinum members is a lot higher than it is for a bronze member or a silver member. So the additional trend matters a lot less. Like most of these people are so far over this deductible and MOOP level that it just doesn't doesn't matter as much as claims increase where, and these deductibles and MOOPs are so low to start with where something like your silver plan that has a very high MOOP, you know, a MOOP near the federal maximum you know, a deductible that's much higher than the platinum one, there's a lot more of that leveraging impact that happens. Um, so that's why we see kind of the much higher, higher premium increase um, is just due to that component. And the, thank you, this is all really helpful. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a complicated thing to follow. When, what you were, um, when you're talking about medical trend leveraging, that, that what went through my mind is that that seems to be, um, uh, an estimation about how many beneficiaries are likely to go over their um, deductible and MOOP, which is then just a cost to the to the payer, mm -hmm. right? And so either medical trend on its own or medical trend leveraging, the the driver of of medical trend are the prices that are charged to to patients, right? So there'll be a price component and there'll be a utilization component. Um, and it'll differ year by year and plan by plan um, what those exactly are. But I would say usually more than half is on the price side. Um, I think it's okay. fair to say typically. Uh, that you answered my next question is, can you divide out the price <laughs> versus utilization? So over half of the medical trend change year to year is driven in your estimate right, um, mm -hmm. by rising prices. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. That helps a lot. And thanks for looking back at the tables with me. That's a quick question while this table is up, perhaps. Um, in terms of, I'm looking at the ER copay, mm -hmm. coinsurance column, and the drop from 500 down to 250. Um, I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the logic behind that um, when we think about trying to deter avoidable ED visits and encourage more PCP visits. So is there a, you know, um, is there a, any thought to perhaps increasing the number of visits, sorry, now it's gone, but the number of free visits for primary care, uh, but keeping the ER deductible high. And I also was curious about um, on the same page, the pharmacy generic dropping it from 20 to 15 to encourage more generic use or alternatively kicking up the, the um, 
non-generic copay. You know, the sticks versus carrots. So I'm, I'm just sort of curious the logic behind some of that. Yeah, so on the ER side, a key thing to note here is that the medical deductible is not waived for ER admissions. So if you're below your deductible and go to the ER, the whole cost goes to your deductible. So it's going to be a very, you know, fairly expensive claim. I've got several toddlers. We've had some ER claims for various things over the years. So I have more knowledge than right. I would prefer to of, of ER costs. Um, so that if you're under the deductible, you're still, you know, seeing that whole claim. Um, yeah. It's only going to be people between the deductible and the out-of-pocket max who even see that copay. Um, and, you know, at that point, you know, there's a question between discouraging and, and you know, just high cost sharing, you know, $500 is a, is a high copay for any ER visit. That's, you know, close to the, you know, I'd say 50% co-insurance for at least a lot of, a lot of our mm -hmm. ER visits um, for asthma and EpiPens and the like. Um, and then, you know, slashing this, you're not going to impact that many visits because most people will either be under the deductible or over the MOOP. And again, it's only those visits that take place in between that are hit. And then we had just increased to that level back in 23, um, which was kind of part of the suite of changes needed just to get the plan compliant. Um, so at that point, I don't know that it was a very, you know, we want to decrease these visits, so we're going to double this copay as much as uh, this plan has to be compliant. You know, what can we do um, with as little, you know, hopefully impact on on behavior as uh, on needed medical behavior that we can make to just get this plan compliant. Um, so reversing it, you know, seem seem like a reasonable approach to take. Um, it doesn't have a whole lot of premium impact again because there's only going to be a small portion of visits kind of in that window. Um, so it's kind of the, the thought behind that. On the generic side again, it was pretty similar logic where this was just increased back in 2023 again. Um, you know, the the brand copay was increased at the same time. We left that one the same. Um, so relative to where they've been in the past, there's more difference now between those two. It used to be a, a $45 difference. It increased to 50. Now we've increased it to 55. Um, Got it. And on the on the office visit side, it was 2023 again, where we, we switched to those three free visits. Um, we didn't have any explicit discussions about, excuse me, sorry, um, about changing that, the number of free visits um, as an alternative. You know, this was a plan where we were, again, kind of wary of premium impact at least a little bit. Um, so that, that's kind of where we ended up there. I don't know if that's hopefully that's helpful. Yeah, no, thank you. I appreciate it. I think there's so much here. We all have to dig in. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> as I was as as my colleague Tom was talking, I was staring a little bit more in detail at this and just thinking about some of those trade offs and wondered what the motivation might have been. So I appreciate mm -hmm. it. Thank you. Yeah, and this year was definitely different in that we actually could explore those trade-offs a bit on some of these plans as opposed to a lot of years where it's just how do we get compliant. Um, so it was definitely definitely a different environment. And as Darren said, I think we were we found it attractive to be able to take two benefits and bring them back to the level from prior years and to be able to market it that way. The um, stakeholders felt that that could be a, an attractive change. And also with the drug copay at generic level, many of those drugs come in at less than a $15 price to begin with. So um, the thought was that, that that still wouldn't go through to the um, to the enrollee, but it would be an impactful change to see. Any other questions? I'm all set. Thank you. Perfect. Dana, do I go back to you now? Um, I, we have nothing additional to present. I think, um, you know, we'll leave it to the board. Great. Um, we're going to hold public comment in the event that there is any. Um, are you actually? Are you folks leaving after this, or are you staying? I, 
should probably leave actually <laughs> you know have yeah, you're welcome to stay but <laughs> I, I believe we were planning on leaving once we once we finish this question. yeah 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 and then of course, so why don't i actually next, do next week um oh. laura go ahead hi um uh with susan not here uh i'll point out that there is a uh um, we'll accept public comment on these uh, proposed uh, 2025 standard qualified health plan designs until the end of the day on February 6, 2024. Um, and people can comment by visiting our website and clicking on the public comment option or by emailing us at gmcb.board at vermont.gov. So Laura, I have not contemplated a stand-in for Susan, but now I know where to go if I need one. That was well done. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> um, all right, well, I'll take public comment now. So um, if anyone has public comment, please use the raise your hand function. Uh, Sharon, hey, how are you? Please go ahead. Hi. I'm just getting back. <laughs> so I was just thinking about this, how it might be helpful to the board to have um, measures that I think would be pretty easy for the commercial payers to provide, uh, maybe even other providers. But in the total health care expenditures of a commercial payer, we understand um, that the costs are from direct care and then the cost of an insurer to provide the insurance, which you can name admin or whatever you want to call it. But um, the, the total of what the insurer pays to the direct care, and I understand in the direct care of a provider, there's also admin, but we're just going to say, what does the insurance company pay for this care? And then, um, also collect what it is that the consumer pays. So the consumer's uh, payments would be the premiums, the deductibles um, payments, the payments that go to deductibles, the co-pays, the co-insurance. And I would even include uh, subsidies because frankly, you know, that's taxpayers consumer of healthcare. But if it's complicated, it's not, not as necessary. But I am thinking if you track these sort of numbers, if, if you can reduce this complicated uh, expenditures of health care, and this is what the insurance company has paid, and, and they already give you that number, um, but what, what's lacking is how much have Vermonters actually contributed to health care costs? Um, because I, it, it struck me just with the deductible of $1,600, that's a lot of money. And I'm thinking, and certainly in my case, um, what I contributed to health care, I never received any benefits being a healthy person. And, and so that's an expenditure, right? I'm paying for health care. And um, that's, I'm not saying that's right or wrong. What I'm saying is, it's important for regulators to really get a grip of how much an insurance company that's insuring Vermonters pays out of their pocket versus what Vermonters are paying out of their pocket. And frankly, I'm just curious. It just struck me how we don't really know that. But an insurance company would know that because they track all of the bills. They just put them in different categories. They'll put them into the deductible, the copay, the coinsurance, and then what they pay to the provider. So they can add those up. Or you can drill down. I mean, certainly you can get into this if you really want to know, okay, how much of a, the percentage of total health care dollars are going into premiums or how much the percentage is going into out-of-pocket costs with copay co-insurance or, or whatever in pharmaceuticals. But I'm thinking that we don't have that information or do we? And I just haven't ever gotten a handle of it. Um, well, thank you for your comment. Um, 
there is a basic measure that comes up in rate review every year, um, medical loss ratio, which gives you the amount of money from the insurance company, their income that goes out towards paying for medical bills, right? So you can see how much of the cost of what they receive is relating to their operations. And if memory serves, there's certain standards you want to look for. I believe ours were somewhere in the 90th, 90th, 92nd percentile or something like that from, from my memory. Um, in terms of like categorizing out each bucket of money from consumers, uh, I don't know if I've seen that, but it's, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, I'm sure if they're large amounts. Um, Tom, did you have so, something? Go ahead. So, do, so does the board uh, know how much Vermonters pay? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So <clears throat> you total the amount of people that are enrolled with an insurance company, then total the amount of their premiums, deductible and out of pocket expenses. All of that money is pooled. Right? And then when people are sick and need to use it, it comes out of the pool. And a small percentage, usually around 10 to 15%, comes out to run the insurance company. But when you ask what proportion of payments are from Vermonters versus from insurance companies, the proportion from Vermonters is 100%. The proportion from the insurance company that is not from a premium, a deductible, or an out-of-pocket expense is zero. Insurance companies are not putting their own money into the care of people. We are contributing money with our premiums, out-of-pocket expenses, and deductibles. That money is pooled and then used to pay the bills. So the answer to your question is 100%. That's I see. how insurance um, works. Okay. Thanks for explaining. Um, and then I'll just flag um, that there is the expenditure analysis, which has some of this broken out as well, which um, uh, member Lunge has flagged and she can send to you or one of us will send to you. Um, any other public comment? Great, okay, we will move on and thank you, Dana and um, Addie. Um, next we have, uh, and Darren and the Wakely folks, um, the Health Resource Allocation Plan Update um, by Ms. Fialkowski and Ms. Morton. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Let me just take a moment to share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen? Yep. Great. Uh, so good afternoon. Um, today I will be providing a uh, health resource allocation plan update. Um, I'm Veronica Fialkowski, the Director of Data Analytics Management here at Green Mountain Care Board. And my co-presenter will be Micah Morton, a data analyst also at Green Mountain Care Board. So the goal of today's presentation is to provide an update on ATRAP, and we will review the following items. So what is ATRAP? Um, but really today's focus will be on um, special topics, including gender affirming care, reproductive care services, both which will be presented by Micah Morton, um, the Workforce Data Center, which is an update provided by AHS, presented by me, um, State Health Improvement Plan, an update provided by the Vermont Department of Health, also presented by me. Um, Act 167, talking about the relationship between ATRAP and Act 167, and then a little bit of, of a roadmap for the future. Um, so 18 VSA 9405 requires GMCB to develop and maintain ATRAP. Um, legislature established ATRAP in 2003 and updated it in 2018. Um, the purpose of ATRAP is to identify Vermont's critical health needs, services, resources, to inform boards' regulatory processes, cost containment, statewide, statewide quality of care, healthcare payment, et cetera, for, um, and 
any allocation of health resources in the state. So really, um, ATRAP identifies health care services and gaps in availability or accessibility and considers the underlying health needs across communities in Vermont. Um, this slide is to show that ATRAP is not just one data source. It's a series of dynamic reports, visualizations, and other tools designed to convey relevant information. Many entities across the state are conducting work that helps us understand our current resources, needs, and gaps. Um, ATRAP includes data from many partners, including Green Mountain Care Board, the Vermont Department of Health, Vaz NSO, DIVA, et cetera. Um, Vermont has a variety of health data resources, uh, which measure and evaluate supply, distribution, cost of healthcare services in Vermont. GMCB stewards two of those health data resources, um, the hospital discharge data set, known as BUDS, and then the all-payer claims database, known as VCURES. However, these two data sources alone cannot answer all of our questions, which is why we consider ATRAP very ATRAP very collaborative, and this image shows that. Um, ATRAP resources are updated on the GMC website. The website is currently organized by healthcare resources, has a community focus, and a number of other public reports. Um, here's just a few snapshots of some of the information available on the webpage. Special topics. These are the topics we'll be talking about. Once again, reproductive care services, gender affirming care, healthcare workforce data center, state health improvement plan, and Act 167. Mm -hmm. um, just before I hand it off to Micah, I wanted just to provide some context of these two topics. Um, 18 VSA 9405, the statute um, requiring GMCB to host ATRAP and provide some ATRAP details, was amended last year to require including these two topics in ATRAP. The amended section says that board, the board shall include reproductive health care services and gender affirming health care services as those terms defined in one VSA 150. And these definitions will be provided on a subsequent slide that Micah will show. Um, I'd like to mention that what we can do with our data sets in terms of analysis is quite limited. Um, and Micah will review more of this, but as a high level, those include um, when trying to understand abortion services under the reproductive care service definition. GMC data only allows us to provide hospital abortion services, which represents a small amount of services provided in Vermont, and then also can we can provide the count of abortion service claims. And this is because in VCURES or our claims database, the provider and patient information related to abortion services are classified as unavailable. So functionally, this means abortion care claims do not have um, individual providers, organizations, and, or patient demographic details. Um, in terms of for gender affirming care, we run into challenges um, around small numbers, which you'll see without and within like outline in Micah's presentation. Um, so Micah is going to provide a few interesting findings from her research in these ATRAP topics. So I'm gonna hand it over to Micah. Hey, um, I'm excited to present this for you guys. Um, so given how broad some of the definitions for gender affirming care and reproductive care were, um, in, in the legislature, the scope for this project was pretty wide, and because it's so wide, I've chosen to just pick a couple interesting topics and a smattering of findings, otherwise we'd be here for a really long time. <laughs> um, so first I'll present on gender affirming care, focusing on medication use and surgeries, and then I'll move on to um, reproductive care, where we have some slides on abortion, um, pregnancy prevention, and annual law woman exams. Um, so gender affirming care, actually, next slide. Um, what is it? <laughs> gender affirming care encompasses a range of so social, psychological, behavioral, and medical interventions designed to support and affirm an individual's gender identities. So gender affirming care can be for both trans or cisgender people, but for the sake of this presentation, I'll be referring only to transgender affirming care. Uh, next slide, please.
Um, hormone replacement therapy for transgender patients is primarily composed of two categories, feminizing hormones and masculinizing hormones. There are puberty blockers, but they're not represented here. But they're typically prescribed um, to people under 18 going through puberty. So estrogen, spironolactone, and progesterone are by far the most common feminizing hormones, but they're not the, typically the only options, but they were the ones that were prescribed um, like by far the most common. And masculinizing HRT is primarily testosterone. So the last four years, there's been a significant increase in HRT prescriptions, roughly doubling the number of prescriptions in both categories. Next slide, please. So we see the same increase in gender-affirming surgeries with an annual growth rate of 27.8% over the last four years. Those have also doubled in that stretch of time. Um, and gender-affirming care can be split into top and bottom surgeries, with top surgeries being the most common surgery um, and uh, mastectomies being the most common of those of the top surgeries. And just to note, not all transgender individuals opt elect to have surgery um, nor want surgery either. Next, please. Um, so there were 379 gender affirming surgeries procedures for trans folk perform performed in the last four years that were captured in VCARES. Um, with the states known of those, 136 were performed out of state or approximately one in three. Um, those going to New Hampshire were mostly going to Dartmouth and roughly 54% of those going to New Hampshire were on Medicaid. So there's perhaps a lack of surgeons that perform gender affirming care surgeries that take Medicaid in, or in Vermont. And the vast majority of surgeries performed in the last four years, like I said, were um, mastectomies and specifically masculinizing top surgery. Um, nowhere in Vermont does bottom surgeries and only certain types of breast augmentation are done in state um, for more specifics um, or complicated breast augmentation surgeries that's done out of state. Next, please. So as patients establish care and hormone levels, levels stabilize, it's expected to see less visits annually and less frequent prescription instances because the care remains the same year after year. Uh, but we would expect to see at least four visits in four years. And this continuation of care is important because receipt of um, gender affirming care, including um, HRT, is associated with 60% um, lower odds of moderate to severe depression and 73% lower odds of suicidality. And in a national study of transgender patients who discontinued gender affirming care, 82.5% cited external factors like social pressure and lack of access. Um, moving on, um, oh, next slide, please. Yeah, so moving on to reproductive services. As I mentioned, there is a huge range of what counts as reproductive care. Um, so there's too much to present with re re reproductive care, which covers contraceptives, abortion, preventative screenings, prenatal care, mental health services, um, and more. So I've selected just a few interesting points. Next one. Um, so these numbers are from the Vermont Vital Statistics Report and based on the Adequacy of Prenatal Care Utilization Index. So early and comprehensive prenatal care is essential for a healthy pregnancy and birth. 67% uh, of Vermont mothers received um, what was classified as inadequate care, and 2.4% received no care or delayed care until the third trimester. Um, those numbers are down from 2020. Um, and 45 plus year old mothers had the highest percentage of adequate plus intensive care. And 15 to 19 and 40 to 44 years old had the highest percentage of inadequate care. Next. Um, so this, this slide is based on patient origin and abortions per capita. So there were um, 1,033 abortions in 2021. And we have to use the vital stats data because as Veronica mentioned, V-cures suppresses and masks information on both patient and provider. Um, so I chose to make this per capita um, so as to account for the difference in populations and county. Um, there's a broad range of per capita abortion ranging from um, just under one per um, 10,000 patients to almost 17 in some counties. Uh, next, please. So abortion or clinics were the most frequent providers of abortions by far. Of the 
1,033 abortions in 2021. 920 were provided by an abortion clinic. Um, just under 70% of these abortions were captured in um, claims and decures, which feels like kind of to be expected just based on the percentage that is captured in general in decures. Um, next, please. Um, overall, abortion is trending down both in Vermont and nationally. This is usually credited to um, increased access to preventative measures and education. Next. Speaking of preventative measures, there has been a spike in sterilization procedures, particularly post-2020. So this includes vasectomies, tubal ligation, and similar procedures. The same increase is also reflected in long-term abortion, like IEDs at implants, or daily or short-term pregnancy preventions, like oral contraceptives and injectables, have a decreased prevalence over the past four years. Next. So while women exams are recommended to occur annually as preventative care, so it could be a in, in good indicator for if reproductive preventative care is being utilized. Women living in more urban parts of Vermont are roughly 1.48 times more likely to have received a well woman exam than those living in rural areas. Next. Uh, for more detailed look, we can look at the odds ratios of a woman receiving a well woman annual preventative screening exam by county. Um, for this slide, Chittenden is used as the reference category here. And um, of all note, all key values were significant, so all of them. Um, and Orange County has the lowest odds with a woman in Orange County being roughly a third as likely as a woman in Chittenden of having completed a well woman exam. Um, that's all I have for you for my monologue, <laughs> but um, I'll have this written up as a full report with additional information and data visuals in the near future. Um, and I can do take questions. How about we take questions at the end and okay. I'll finalize um, That's awesome. the presentation. Thank you, Micah. Go ahead. Um, yeah, so as Micah mentioned, this, um, these analyses on some of the access and interesting findings will be packaged and part of HRAP um, online. Um, so moving on to our next update. So the Healthcare Workforce Data Center um, and these updates are provided by Agency of Human Services. So the goal of the data center is to support a healthier Vermont where all receive equitable, affordable and quality healthcare. Um, this is a new workforce center developed recently and is under Agency of Human Services. And the mission is to collect, manage, and report on health workforce data to health employers, employees, current and prospective, and policymakers to aid in health workforce development across the state. The Agency of Human Services has executed a contract for consulting on the establishment of the Healthcare Workforce Data Center, and the work will produce several reports, which include a stakeholder analysis report, um, a reporting and analytics plan, and then a five-year operations plan that will include a projection of staffing data and budgetary needs. In addition to collecting, managing, and reporting on standard education, supply, and demand pipeline data, the data center will also seek to collect data on health equity in the healthcare workforce. Um, by December 2024, early January 25, the data center will have completed the necessary research and stakeholder engagement and data governance activities as outlined here in the phased approach. Um, on the slide to fully implement a healthcare workforce data center in Vermont in a financially responsible and technologically secure way by utilizing existing infrastructure within the unified health data space, which has been presented in the past. Um, this work at the workforce data center will ultimately provide um, information and data to be able to provide recommendation for resource allocation by identifying work, workforce gaps. This is how it fits into HRAP. It will just be another tool and data source for us to utilize. Now an update on the state health assessment and improvement plan provided by the Vermont Department of Health. 
presented by GMCV. Um, so the state health assessment, or I'll refer to it as the Shaw, um, is done every five years. The last Shaw was completed in 2018. So now is a good time to reassess what has changed, what has gotten worse, what's improved in health, especially in the light of COVID. So the Shaw is the overview of what we know about health and well-being of Vermonters at, in, at a point in time, um, an analysis of quantitative and qualitative data that examine health inequities by race, ethnicity, gender, age, sexual orientation, disability, socioeconomic status, and geography. So the Shaw is used as the basis for developing the SHIP or the State Health Improvement Plan. I'll refer to it as the SHIP. Um, which is the five-year plan that includes the goals and improvement strategies that the department and other state and community partners commit to working on to promote health and health equity for all people in Vermont. So kind of to summarize, the Shaw is what we know and the SHIP is what we do about it. So centering data collection for the Shaw um, and priority strat strategies in the SHIP around these populations listed here, um, they experience the greatest rates of health inequities, especially since COVID. Um, so VDH expects to take about two years to develop both the SHAW and the SHIP, followed by the five-year period of implementing the plan and monitoring um, progress towards meeting the state's goals. Um, VDH is committed to be intentional about following through and tracking progress over time. Um, the big lift happens in these first two years and the work continues even after that. Um, there are two key data collection activities, one being the environmental scan. So this establishes a baseline understanding of common health needs experienced by Vermonters looks for needs by district communities of focus um, and across the state. It identifies patterns and trends and topics worthy for further exploration and data collection. Um, so they review um, public data sources, providing health data for the entire state and then counties, community groups experiencing the highest rates of health inequities as presented in the previous slide. Um, some examples of those data sources in their environmental scan included county health rankings, the behavioral risk factor surveillance system, VT211 referrals, household health insurance survey, et cetera. There's many different data sources that they've used. Um, there's also a community engagement aspect, which includes interviews and focus groups, both virtual and in person. Compensation is provided for people's time and expertise. Um, with interpretation and translation services and child care offered um, to really get as many folks in the room as possible. Um, this is both statewide and in all 12 districts. Um, so far, um, as of January 16th, these are, this is kind of what's been completed. So there's seven data briefs briefs summarizing findings by population and statewide posted on the health department. They're quite nice. I recommend looking at them. Um, they're, it, they've done 70, it involved 75 plus organizations in their community engagement. 44 focus groups have been completed or scheduled and 26 interviews have been completed or scheduled. Here's just a summary of um, the completed focus groups um, and kind of by which county and community they represent. Data will be shared with people who participated in the community engagement process. Um, and then the health department will share county level data with hospitals for use in their community health needs assessments as well. And as you can see that, as you can see, this initiative is related to ATRAP as it identifies healthcare needs and a plan for action with a focus on people and specific communities. Um, so that's definitely under the ATRAP umbrella. And next I'm going to discuss Act 167, which has a hospital focus and how that fits under the ATRAP umbrella. So Act 167, um, hospital system transformation and community engagement process. Um, so Act I just said, Act 167 has a hospital focus or hospital area focus. 
concentrating on people who use hospital, the hospital in each area. So my goal is really not to speak about what Act 167, what Act 167 is or the purpose of it, but rather show that Act 167 work can be considered under that ATRAP umbrella. The process includes both community engagement and data analysis, and then these data help understand the current state and also potential recommendations for the future based on gaps and needs of the hospital focus areas learned by the community engagement process. So the outputs from the process are to help hospitals reduce inefficiencies, lower costs, improve population health outcomes, reduce health inequities, and increase access to essential services. So there are many different data analyses being conducted for Act 167. Um, the, these are just a few examples, but these um, all help to understand the gaps and needs. And as part of the process, we'll provide recommendations for healthcare resource allocation. Some other work products that I thought I'd mention that are either just completed or worked on, um, being worked on, um, is the market share report, um, which is prepared using the annual statement supplement report or ASSR. The ASSR is required by 8 CSA 3561. And this kind of summary report provides insight on earned premiums by commercial payers, which kind of provides a slice, slice of the cost data. Um, and then hospital service inventory, um, we are working on an updated one with 2022 data, um, but the one for 2021 was generated from our hospital discharge data and provides information on the number of individuals seeking care by hospital, by procedure, so inpatient and outpatient, a whole slew of different procedures under those. And we've heavily used this inventory for Act 167 as well. A little bit about the future. Um, thought I'd start with just re-summarizing um, kind of our vision for ATRAP. So ATRAP should capture what is happening in the state in terms of healthcare accessibility, quality, and cost, and how we want to allocate our healthcare resources deliver up-to-date, sustainable, and dynamic resources that enables more informed health resource allocation, allocation decision-making across Vermont using data, focus on the needs of each regulatory process of GMCB, for example, certificate of need, and then foster a collaborative process. Here's a snapshot of our 2024 timeline. The intention is really not to see all the details. I know. You do not need a squint, but we just want to show that we have many upcoming projects um, or updates to some of our existing work that either get updated annually or on some, you know, a recurring basis. Um, and then I think this also shows, again, that this is a really a collaborative, there's a collaborative nature to ATRAP. The white background kind of um, pieces there at the top are mostly what GMCB's, GMCB is doing. Blue is other stakeholders um, from across different state agencies and different partners. And then the peach color are the different inventories that we update um, or have plans to update, which we work very closely with other agencies to understand. Um, and then just to finalize, ATRAP is an ongoing process and it requires these, what I like to think of these four components for both like ATRAP as a whole, but then also these individual pieces to it. So we have, you know, the requirements gathering, engaging stakeholders, collecting the data or analyzing it, reporting, and then how do we visualize and package that information to get our point across and then start over. Uh, so it's kind of part of that ATRAP framework and needs to be considered as we move forward. So I think now we can turn it over to Chair Foster. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll open up to the other board members. I had just one question, which was, is this Miss Morton's first presentation to the board or am I missing one from my memory? First, first one. one. Mm -hmm. oh, great, congratulations. And um, thanks for doing it. You did a really nice job. Well done. Um, yeah. I don't know how to do the like emoji thing people do, but if I did, they would be going. Um, any uh, board member questions or comments? 
I just want to say thanks. That's a lot of work. <laughs> and thanks for doing such a good job summarizing all the different pieces. So appreciated it. And it was nice to get an update. Thank you. I have a couple questions. Um, one is on, I was intrigued by and concerned by um, the gender affirming care and the potential barriers to access for Medicaid um, enrollees. So I'm wondering if we might be able to do a deeper dive into that and try and understand that. You know, we're obviously very concerned about access and that seems to be, if that's, you know, if we can learn a little bit more about that, that would be really helpful. Um, and then uh, my second question was about um, reproductive care. And I wondered if it's possible to break down, it may not be, I understand the um, barriers with V cures, but with abortions, is there any way to unpack the, um, the proportion that are medication abortions versus surgical abortions, particularly given the Supreme Court uh, case in front of them about the FDA approval of, what is it called, Mephet? Mephesperone, I can't remember, Mephepris, I can't say it, <laughs> but the abortion pill. So I'm just wondering, I mean, if, you know, that could have some impact. And so I'm wondering if we have a way to um, unpack that. Yes. So in the vital statistics report, um, they do actually have that, those numbers broken down by like the non-surgical options, and that was uh, 743 of the 1,033 were non-surgical abortions. Okay. So I think it's usually 50-50 in the rest of the country. So we have a um, disproportionately more non-surgical abortions, it seems like. Yeah, so um, it's part, part of it is because most of them here are occurring um, under 10 weeks. Um, and my last question actually has to do with, uh, if you could put the timeline back on, thank you so much for that. That was really helpful. Um, the timeline back up for the HRAP. And I'm, I just want to, I'm wondering, um, how we start to think about integrating a lot of this fantastic work that's in here in our hospital budget process. So, you know, I, I'm seeing we have got the patient migration analysis, we have overuse analysis, we have market share report, hospital services inventory, all of these are, you know, and I, there's a hospital profiles by hospital. Um, and I'm just thinking as we're, you know, in, in the coming weeks, we're gonna be talking about our guidance for the, you know, next cycle and I'm just, trying to figure out how do we integrate some of this even more so than we have in the past. So I don't have an answer for that. I just, yeah. um, well, I, I want to make sure that we're really like using this wonderful collection of data and analysis that everybody is doing and ha help us inform our decision-making and hospital budget review. So sure. just want to throw and that I'll, out there. Yeah. And I'll just mention, I think some of our goal with the hospital profile that you mentioned is to take some of this information that we're already producing, like when we're thinking of by hospital stratifications and put it into these profiles. So it is to support other, you know, other regulatory duties, but also the hospital budget as like a supplemental data piece and take some of these by hospital analyses and put it into this one place to kind of streamline the amount of information we have. So we've already started thinking about that um, at least for the by hospital viewpoint for now. Um, and maybe that can kind of pave a pathway of like how we think about data in the future as well. I wonder if it's, and maybe this is too soon, so this might be too big an ask. Um, and so please tell me that it is, if it is. Right. But I'm just wondering, I think in the, towards the, maybe the third week in February, it looks like we have a, our first conversation around hospital budget guidance. I'm wondering, is it possible to see by then a template for what those hospital profiles might look like. So we have a better sense of some of the data that we're gonna see compiled in a profile. Um, so I can't, I don't have the timeline in front of me. We're con working with a contractor to begin those phases of the um, hospital profiles. Um, you know, what we 
can provide us kind of the ideas we have of what information we want to add into it. So we're kind of approaching it with a, a phased approach. So phase one will have more utilization metrics in it because that's readily available data to us that we have. Um, and then as we're thinking about with in the future and working closely with Elena to make sure that these data pieces and metrics that will be in those profiles are helpful in that hospital budget process as well. So we are definitely collaboratively working on those. That sounds fantastic. No, I think it might be helpful. It might be helpful for board members to weigh in on what would be helpful to them to see in those hospital profiles as we yeah, think about what's so important in our decision making. So mm -hmm. yeah, thank you so much. I'm very excited about all this. We've been, you know, this this work has been, you know, going on for years and I really feel like it's coming together to a place where we can really use it. And I really appreciate it. So yeah, thank you so, so much. Of course, it's fun to see like all the different work happening or, or in different kind of groups that kind of do fit in this umbrella. Yeah, putting those pieces it's all coming together. together and it's going to be fantastic. So thank yeah. you. Thank you. All right, any public comment? Okay, well, thank you both very much and um, have a good afternoon. And is there any um, old or new business to come before the board? And a motion to adjourn? I moved. Second. And all in favor say aye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Have a nice day. We're adjourned.